I've been fascinated by archaeology since I was a kid. In fact, some of the very first adventures I went on as a young lad involved archaeology in Scotland, the Middle East, investigating Roman ruins in Italy. But this adventure is going to be really different. This time, I'm working with professional career archaeologists at an important site. I'm hoping that we're going to find something significant in the field, and then we're going to take it to the lab, and we're going to go through the process to try and understand exactly how archaeology sheds light not only on the history of humanity, but on where we might go in the future. My first step on this journey will be to meet with Jerry Howard, the director of archaeology at the Arizona Museum of Natural History. Author, musician, meteorite hunter, adventurer. I've led an eventful life. Now I'm exploring exciting STEM careers and recording what I find in the STEM journals. Jeff, I thought I might find you here. Why on earth would you think that I would be right here <laughs> with your beautiful cast of the Tucson ring? I like the way the kids uh, actually handle it and wear off the patina on the bronze. <laughs> My great passion in life is meteorite science, and there are quite a few parallels between our work. We have to collect these objects, we have to do it in a way where it's recorded in detail, and then take them back to the laboratory and analyze them, see what they can tell us. Jerry, where are we and what is this amazing place? Well, Jeff, this is uh, Mesa Grande. It's one of the two great temple mounds that were built by the Hohokam people here in Salt River Valley. And I think great is really the operative word here. This is an enormous structure. And even though these look like natural hills, they're not. This was all made by hand. This is a instruction by people to create an artificial mountain or a platform. When was this amazing structure built? Well, we think they started building the mound around 1100 AD. But the Hohokam themselves were here considerably before that. They probably appear right around the time of Christ. The Hohokam were actually a unique group in all of North America. And what made them unique was the fact that they constructed this enormous integrated irrigation system, canals to bring water to feed their crops of corn, squash, and beans. We suspect that part of this gathering area and bringing in the public was feasting. We're actually looking at the animal bone here to see if we can prove or disprove that hypothesis. Let me introduce you to Allison. Uh, she's Please. working on a unit down here where you'll be gathering information. This is our dig site right here. Documenting where the material is found is just as important as the material. This is a dig unit that's perfectly square, two meters by two meters. We use some clever mathematics Pythagorean theory to make sure that we get ourselves a perfect square. And then we dig down very carefully, layer by layer, exposing the next surface and keeping the sides perfectly vertical. Would you like to come in? If you don't mind. Fabulous, you look just the part. Thank you. Later, Indiana. Thanks, Jerry, it's been a pleasure. All right, I'm ready to get started. So if you look here, this is actually a 19th century whiskey bottle. People were drinking down here at the they ruins. Were. Let's go down and get some more whiskey. I think a lot of that happened in the 19th century. So this shows the amount of time that's passed since the 1800s when someone was down here drinking whiskey. That's exactly right. Now in comparison, if you look over here, this is Hohokam. Right here. What do you See think if you it can is? take that layer off. I think it's a grinding stone that's called a mano. Now, manos and matates were used to grind corn. It was the staple diet. Inevitably, it was also the death because corn is very sweet. The manos and matates were stone, and as they ground down the corn, tiny weeny little bits of rock would get into their meal. Everything that they ate kind of chipped away at their teeth, and between that and the very sweet diet, it gave them terrible dental caries. So oh. a lot of them died from gum disease. Died of toothache? So, that must be right. awful. It's very important to brush your teeth. What do we do now? Do we dig it out? What's the process? We're going to leave that in situ and we're going to document it just as it is. And we also need to document this feature right here. You can actually see there's a lot of charcoal around here. It actually looks like it's curving around. I think it's a hearth. 
Now the difference between a feature and an artifact is, here's an artifact Oops. right here. Artifacts you can actually pick up and take away. Features, as you remove a feature, you destroy it. So we need to document that. We need a pencil and our grid. We're gonna start taking measurements. Now, it's not like gardening. Take your trowel like this. This flat side right here is just perfect for taking small layers off at a time. Once you fill your dustpan, put it in your bucket. Oh. Ooh. I've got something. something I've got there. something. It looks like a rabbit bone. It actually looks like a rabbit femur. Now the hohokam, they ate a lot of rabbits. That was almost entirely their meat diet. I'll probably put that in the bucket. We're nearly done filling up the bucket. And then next we're gonna do screening. Yay. How about that? Give okay. it a good shake. Off we go. Fantastic. This stone just looks like a stone. It actually turns out it's a lithic. I actually used it as a scraper. It sits quite nicely in my hand here. And you can see the edges were sharpened. Right here, it's kind of blunted a little bit. It actually looks like it was used. Would that be used for scraping animal hides? Could be, yes. Let's finish off these last buckets here, and then we'll move on to the Raleigh site. Was Mesa Grande once a mass gathering place for the Hohokam? The Raleigh site may hold clues to prove or disprove Jerry's hypothesis. STEM Journals is sponsored by Copper Point, proud to sponsor STEM education because students who excel in science, technology, engineering, and math will solve the challenges of tomorrow. STEM Journal Supplemental. Jerry Howard and a team from the Arizona Museum of Natural History believe Mesa Grande is a mass gathering area for the Hohokam. By contrast, the Rowley site is an established residential location with different artifacts and features. This area over here, in comparison, is actually a residential area. And what you're looking at right there in front of you is a dwelling. This is the wall. And a whole family lived in this one room. They just had one room. So moms, dads, kids, everybody lived right here. And if that wasn't close enough, aunts and uncles and grandparents lived right next door. Yikes. That really... Uh... <laughs> gives a whole new spin on the closeness of family living. It sure does. It? So in this area, we expect to see residential items and faunal assemblage that go along with everyday life. And in everyday life, the Hohokam probably ate rabbits. But for their feasts and celebrations, maybe they might get a bit more extravagant and hunt down a deer. But right now, it's a hypothesis, so we have to test that. Well, are we going to dig it, or are we going to talk about it? Let's do it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> After successfully learning excavation techniques and gathering data to test our hypothesis, if Mesa Grande was a mass gathering place, I returned to the Arizona Museum of Natural History to process the collection with Carla Booker. Come on down, as usual, the scientists are always thrown to the basement. <laughs> There's something ironic about archaeologists being down underground. Welcome to an edition of Jeff's Rock and Roll Kitchen. Tonight we're having shard salad. Wow, you're doing a great job, Jeff. You've Thank got them you. almost done. Yeah. I see you've got almost all the shards on the drying rack. I thought it was shards. Oh, no, 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 no. Shards are made of ceramic and shards are glass. I don't know how they say it in your country, but that's how we you're do it You're making here. that up. No, you've done a great job. You're almost Thank done. You. Well, you know, I worked my way through archaeology school as a dishwasher. The first thing we do is we take all of our shirts, is put them on the tray, and we try to see if we can make any matches, try to fit together some pieces, maybe see if they were one vessel or something. Perhaps that might fit together. What do you think? 
No. No, no. Try that. Well, after you've gone through and you've done all the sorting and trying to fit them together, then you take a look at other things. For instance, do you have a bunch of painted wares? And then you would try to get all of those together. And do you have another bunch of, of things that might have a rim on them? You put all those together. And you're continuing on down until you get into something else, like looking at the temper. The temper is the pieces of ground up additive that they put into the clay to make it more sturdy and stronger when they fire the piece itself. We can look at these and see if you've got a predominance of perhaps hohokam pieces. And then all of a sudden you've got a few pieces of maybe something from the Anasazi. Were they trading? Was there something changing over time in technology that the Hohokam decided to make something different? No, we can tell by looking at our samples that this is a different type of a ceramic. And that gives us an idea of who was living there. And from that, you can take a look at the chronology and see how things changed over time. What about the animal remains? Well, as you can see, they come in looking like this, a bunch of small pieces, and we have an analyst who will take a look at those to see what type of animal they are. And how they can do that is by using comparisons. They can take a look at a deer that uh, they have in their collection and see if they match up. It really is science as detective work. It really is. We've compiled all this information on the material that we found out at the site. Now what? Then we take all of the data that you've accumulated through your processes of uh, looking at the faunal bone and the ceramics and the other things, and then we give that information to Jerry, who will then compile it and decide whether these things can help prove or disprove his hypotheses that Mesa Grande was a gathering site. He's the man with all the answers. Yes. I think we better go see him. I think you better. When I return to my STEM journals, Jerry reveals the purpose of Mesa Grande. Then, will the discovery of a new archaeological site halt construction of a shopping mall? That's next on the STEM Journals. STEM Journal Supplemental. After sorting through artifacts gathered from both the Mesa Grande and nearby Rowley sites, I am anxious to learn what our digs reveal about the history of Mesa Grande with the Hohokam people. Are we any closer to proving your hypothesis about the usage of the Mesa Grande site? We may have some evidence of ceremonial activities, possibly feasting, and we're also finding some unusual things. We found the wing of a hawk, it looks like, or part of one, that may have been some kind of ceremonial fan. Why is academic archaeology important today? One of the key things we're looking at in all science right now is the concept of sustainability. One of the first departments of sustainability in the country was over at ASU. Is academic archaeology the only career that a young person might pursue, or are there any other avenues that are open? It used to be archaeologists in universities and museums, but now they do what's called cultural resource management. It's done as corporate archaeology. It's basically going out and gathering data from sites that are going to be impacted by construction. In fact, you should go out and meet Bob Larkin. He works for Stantec. It's a big engineering firm, and they also have archaeologists doing archaeology. OK. STEM Journal Supplemental. I've just finished my meeting with Jerry, and he's got such a positive, upbeat outlook on modern archaeology. It's, it's really filled me with enthusiasm. And I'm going to take that positive enthusiasm with me as I meet Bob Larkin, who is a corporate archaeologist. We're going to meet at the site of a proposed shopping area, and I'm also going to be joined by a young STEM investigator. Look who's here. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Bob. Yeah. Are you ready for a walk today? We are ready for a walk. Our client would like us to take a, a look at this to make sure there are no resources here, so we're going to conduct a cultural resources survey. This is the proposed site of a new shopping center? Yes, it is. We're going to walk across the property and transects to make sure that there's nothing there. What's a transect? Here's a topographic map of our project area. This is section 11, 
And as you can see, this is where the client wants to build. And what we'll be doing is walking 15 meters from each other along these straight lines to make sure that we cover the entire area. Sounds just like one of your meteorite hunts. I was just thinking the same thing. This technique that Bob describes is so similar to what we would use for mapping a strewn field, a zone where multiple meteorites have fallen. And you're always prepared for a meteorite hunt. I see that you know me well. Have rock hammer, magnets, we'll dig. Archaeologists use a lot of equipment too, even when conducting a survey. We will have uh, site forms to record sites. So we're going to carry plenty of water, of course. We have GPS units, we have backup compasses. Oh, I have a compass. Where? This is my special wrist compass because a STEM explorer always needs to know where he's going. Uh, how about we use a compass that we can actually see on my phone? You can see this, it's brilliant. You can see this too. That's a telephone. How is there a compass there? I have a compass app. Look, there's nothing that can go wrong with that. You could drop your phone or run out of power or anything. A compass is forever. It's one of the key things that we use in the field. It'll certainly tell us the direction that we're heading makes us able to stay on our transect so that we can find everything. And when we do find something, we'll usually switch to the GPS unit to try to shoot it in to make sure we know exactly where some things are located. Even though you uh, have a, a compass on your phone, I think your smartphone compass is better than his dumb compass. How could you say that? What's with the cane? Are you that old already? No, that's not necessary. I'm only a couple of years older than you are. So. 50 years is only a few for you? It's dog years, so it doesn't count. Anyway, this is not a walking stick. It is a meteorite hunting device. Please take note of the very powerful magnet that is affixed to the end that I use for testing unusual rocks to see if they are, in fact, iron-bearing meteorites. And if you're very good, I might let you try it later. Really? You might. You'd have to be exceptionally good. Actually, so better than you. Oh, <clears throat> that's difficult. But they give you something to aim for. STEM journal, personal log. Well, this seems pleasantly familiar. Walking out in the desert, keeping my eyes on the ground, looking for interesting things. I just can't resist combining a bit of meteorite hunting with some artifact hunting. And it looks like young Kent over there has got a fairly good handle on what he's doing as well. You mentioned that you did some research on this area. What did you find? This particular area is a, a region of high site density, so a great deal of archaeology happened here in the past. I'm interested in being an architect. Was there any way that archaeology and architecture go together? They both start with arc. Absolutely, Kent. There are architectural historians and uh, many architects who specialize in, in historic properties, and they usually find a job assisting with archaeological uh, investigations, determining the importance of historic property. So there's plenty of opportunity in that regard. <laughs> hey, young fella. I think you might need a walking stick after all. Hilarious, Jeff. Careful out there now. Found a flake here, guys. Really? This is called a primary flake because it was a, a single flake taken off a larger rock. They used another implement to pop little tiny flakes off of both sides in order to make a serrated edge so that they could uh, do scraping and cutting activity. Well, the next thing we do is to try to find out if we actually have a site here. And if you just want to turn around and head out two or three yards and we'll just walk around to see if we find more artifacts. Okay. Well, I've got one here already, Bob. There are quite a few potsherds around here. Obviously, these were part of a much larger pot. It's difficult to tell what type of pot when the uh, sherds are this small. But I think that with the amount of material that I'm seeing right now, we definitely have a site here. We'll record this site, but for right now, uh, we're in a very small area. We know exactly where it is, and we'll just continue on our transects. Hey, guys! I found something interesting. Come have a look. 
Well, I'd say this is a pretty significant find. A bit more substantial than the pottery sherds that we picked up earlier. Is it possible that this enormous feature is one of the canals? Very possible. It's a very straight, linear feature. It has berms on both sides, and we were seeing artifacts along here, too. I'm pretty sure that we're looking at a canal. We will definitely record this one. So between the pottery sherds and the canal back here, what does that mean for the shopping? The first thing it means is that uh, my client might not be very happy. This site might be large enough to actually build something on, but it really depends on exactly how far the site extends and what might be open for development. We'll head back and start working on the report, but one really important thing we have to do is to start coordinating with relevant agencies and Native American groups who might want to have a say in what happens to this property. Whew. What did you think of your archaeology experience? I think I've learned a lot and I can easily apply that to my future in architecture. There is a practical application of classical archaeology to today's science, and we're learning by doing. With your uh, walking stick or your meteorite finder, did you happen to find any meteorites? So you just assumed that I didn't find any meteorites out there today? Yep. Well, I hate to disappoint you, mister, but here is a spectacular meteorite. I didn't actually find it today. I just brought it along to show you. STEM Journal, concluding entry. I've always been fascinated by archaeology ever since I was a kid, and I've participated in a number of digs, but this one was special. I felt as if I really got to grips with the scientific method. Archaeology is a vital science, and it's something that should be appealing to young people. It not only helps us understand the past, it also illuminates the future. I want to be an architect, and learning about archaeology has really opened my eyes to see that I need to learn more about the subjects around architecture instead of architecture in general. Now that you know about archaeology, maybe you're interested in a future exploring the past. You should know that it all starts in the classroom. Be sure to focus on biology, history, sociology, languages, and writing. You should know that the University of Arizona has a great archaeology program. But before you even get to college, visit our local museums, talk to an archaeologist, ask your teacher for advice. Stay curious, stay focused. On the next entry of the STEM Journals, I follow the waterways of our desert to find out how it gets to our homes and to learn about the people who work with water.